Hello, everybody. I'm Jennifer Keller, Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library. To honor October's spooky traditions, today we bring you stories of haunted Broadway theaters. In case you're looking for more ghostly ways to entertain yourself this month, we have a few other haunted type programs and the reference team has created some resource guides that can be accessed either by visiting the calendar page for this event or through the resource guide tab at westportlibrary.org. Before we get started, please note that questions for Robert can be typed into the ask a question tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, it's right next to call to action and ask a question. He will leave time at the end of this presentation for those. Now, a little bit about our speaker. Robert Viagas is a longtime editor at Playbill and has been collecting ghostly stories from actors and backstage techs for more than a decade. He has published 20 books and has been a lecturer at several universities. Robert was also featured on the TV series, The Secrets of New York, sharing what else but the stories about haunted theaters. And this just in, started in January, he will also be editor in chief of the new Encore Monthly Magazine. Welcome today, Roger, Robert. And I'm now <laughs> going to leave the screen before I say, call you some other name. <laughs> That's quite all right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming in. Uh, I'm going to post up on the screen. There we go. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about the ghosts of Broadway tonight. And I wanted to uh, introduce oh. myself a little bit. Um, Robert, Robert yes, we don't. you just yes. need to share your screen. Share the screen. I'm going to share my screen because I'm, I'm a sharing kind of person. Bad. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes, we can. Thank you so very much. Good. You're very welcome. Sorry about that. Oh, goodness. There we go. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit to you. Um, uh, she, as she mentioned, I was managing editor at Playbill for 20 plus years. Uh, I have more than 2 million words in print. I've been the author of 20 books. Most of them are on theater. I have seen nearly 2,000 shows on Broadway. Uh, I was a member of the Tony. Uh, I would, not only was I a Tony voter for more than 20 years, but I was actually on the Tony nominating committee 2012-2014, which is an incredible honor. Uh, I've lectured... Uh, all over the place, including at Hofstra, CCNY, and Harvard. And my proudest credit right now is that I have, over all these years, have collected ghost stories. Now, these are not just stories that I have looked up and read somewhere and I'm regurgitating to you. These are stories that I have gathered from actual people who work on Broadway, who work in theaters all over the country, actually theaters around the world. And they believe that they have had ghostly experiences. And these are the only ones that I like to share with people because there is a uh, there is a realness to it. Now, again, I don't know if I personally believe in ghosts. I do believe in ghost stories, though. And I speak to people who believe in the depths of their hearts that they have had these ghostly experiences. Now, I'm going to start off. Does anybody out there know what this is? I will tell you, this is a ghost light. This is... Um, something that is placed on the stage of every theater, every professional theater, and uh, many other theaters as well. Um, it is placed there for a, a number of reasons. Uh, people believe, um, uh, the official reason is this, by the way, the ghost light is required by union rules to be placed on the stage of every Broadway theater. Uh, and ostensibly, the reason is so that if you were walking across the stage that you see here at night, uh, when the other when the lights in the back are, are out, it was they believe it was placed there for safety purposes. The thing is, after hours, there is nobody wandering around the theater, nobody alive. That is, um, the people who work at the theater believe that 
The reason that we have the ghost light is because of the ghosts that haunt the theaters. And most theaters are believed to have ghosts. Uh, the people that work there uh, tell me about these various experiences that, that they've had. When I was editor of the um, Playbill Broadway yearbook, I saw something, I discovered something kind of interesting. Uh, what I would do is every show that opened on Broadway during the 10 years that I was the editor, I would have somebody that I called the correspondent, somebody who worked on the show. And I would ask them a number of questions about what their backstage rituals were and what they did on opening night and what cool stars came to visit. But I would always ask them, have you had any ghostly experiences? And the one thing that I found out, this was every Broadway show at every Broadway theater for 10 years. So I have a, 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 a database of information to draw from. And one thing that I found was that there were certain theaters that always had ghosts. And the ghost stories tended to be pretty consistent from theater to theater and I mean from show to show within that theater. But there were also some theaters that never had ghost stories. I would, the correspondent would apologize to me and would say, I know you were looking for a ghost story, but we really haven't had anything. So there were theaters that always had ghost stories that were pretty much the same and theaters that never had ghost stories. It was almost as if there actually were ghosts at some of the theaters and actually weren't at other of the theaters. So now I'm going to focus tonight on some of those, uh, those stories. Um, uh, there is a famous quote from a Mac Wellman play, a, pl a play called Crowbar, that he said, every theater is haunted. And as I just described to you, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but the ghost light, uh, to, get, to get back to that, the ghost light is placed there because, now there's the good ex explanation and the bad explanation. The good explanation is that the, the people who work in the theater entire lives, working hard, trying to get jobs in the theater, oh God, they want to be on Broadway so badly, they want to be on the stage so badly, that once they get there, they never want to leave, ever. They want to stay there, even after death. Some of them return to the theaters. Uh, and so uh, it's believed that the light is placed on the stage so that when they come out at night, they can strut and fret their hour upon the stage and they can perform as they once did in the empty theater and do their various jobs because it's not just actors who are ghosts. Um, some people, though, believe that the... Um, the light is there for a sign of a sinister purpose that there are some of the theaters, especially the older ones, have so many ghosts in it and they compete with one another that if the ghost light weren't there, that they would take over the theater. Because some of the ghost stories that you're going to hear, the ghosts are kind of mischievous and sometimes vengeful. Uh, and so the light is placed there not to encourage them, but to keep their power at bay. So I leave it up to you what you think. Different actors and different performers, people who work at the theater, have different ideas about what that ghost light is there for. The one thing I can tell you for sure, they all have a ghost light. Okay, uh, my first ghost that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, oh, here, here's a great picture. This is a Photoshop picture. I put this Photoshop picture in here for a reason. Once again, because I don't, this, this is a made up picture. This isn't a photo of an actual ghost. I don't like stories like this that are made up. I like st stories that people believe are real. And I'm, my first one is going to be about Olive Thomas. Olive Thomas, as you can see, a beautiful actress. Um, she uh, had a very short life. Uh, she was only 26 when she died. Uh, Olive came from the Midwest and her, uh, she had a, an early marriage that, that she got out of because she came to New York and everybody told her, your beauty and your talent, you should be in the Ziegfeld Follies. Now, the Ziegfeld Follies were a series of beautiful reviews that they would do at the, at the uh, New Amsterdam Theater in New York, uh, operated by, uh, and by the producer Florenz Ziegfeld. And Florenz Ziegfeld, one of the things that he always did was to showcase the most beautiful actresses that he could find and the most talented actresses. He also showcased uh, some of the top uh, comedic talent of the time. Um, uh, all, all sorts of W.C. Fields and Eddie Cantor and all the great comedians of the early 20th century worked on his shows. He also, he gave opportunities to African Americans. He gave opportunities to women at a time when some people felt that women weren't funny. He made a star of Fanny Bryce and Fanny appeared in the Old the Follies. And among these people, one day walking into his theater was the beautiful Olive Thomas. And 
Olive, um, he immediately hired her over the objections of uh, his wife, um, Billy Burke. You may know Billy Burke. She played uh, the Good Witch of the North in The Wizard of Oz. Later in life, she became an actress herself. But in those days, she was married to Ziegfeld. And she thought that Ziegfeld was a little too interested in Olive. As a matter of fact, Ziegfeld had a, um, a famous uh, uh, painting. Let me see if I can find it. He had a famous famous painting painted of uh, Olive, of her topless. Um, I actually, I took it out of this because some people objected to it. But uh, nobody objected more than Billy Burke, I'll tell you that. In any case, um, Olive, uh, she was the star of, uh, she was featured in um, a show that they called The Midnight Frolics. Uh, in the New Amsterdam theater, there are two stages, or were two stages. There was the big down, downstairs stage where Aladdin has been playing for a long time. Uh, and that's where the follies were given. But uh, Ziegfeld also had a late night show that was a little bit more R-rated. And it was done on the roof of the theater. Um, the, the, in those days before air conditioning, a lot of theaters uh, would actually have performances on the roof so that they could operate during the summer. Uh, and it was a little bit cooler out there on the roof under the stars. Uh, and Olive was, uh, appeared in, uh, in the 1915 um, Midnight Frolics. And Olive's uh, act consisted of, now uh, they would not have an act like this today, but they had a big cannibal stew pot on the stage. And um, out of this pot, these beautiful actresses would appear and they'd jump out of the pot like jumping out of a cake and they would do their performance. And um, to get into the pot, there was a ladder under the stage. Now the section under the stage is known as the trap. That's where the word trap door comes from. It's the door that goes down to the trap. So they ha the trap is the section under the stage where they keep scenery and, and uh, tools and, and uh, they store things under there. In any case, remember that. Uh, Olive would come up through uh, the trap on a ladder and she'd come out of this pot and she would do her dance. And she was uh, so, um, she, the impression that she made on the audience was so incredible. Um, everybody wanted her, and she was very quickly scooped up, taken out to California, and she started appearing in silent films. She was one of the first um, uh, sexy blonde, uh, act blonde bombshells, I guess you'd call it, um, in Hollywood history. And she was in numerous, I'm sorry, numerous is, a, is an exaggeration. She was in five or six uh, silent films, and she was featured in them. And uh, Immediately, every all of Hollywood, lit to Hollywood, uh, wanted to get to know her, and um, she was courted by a guy named Jack Pickford. His sister was Mary Pickford, who was kind, she was kind of queen of the movies in those days. Jack was not a very nice guy, but this was Olive's chance, Olive's chance to join Hollywood royalty, and so she married Jack. Jack was not a nice guy. Uh, Jack, um, he drank too much. He, even though he had, he was married to the beautiful Olive Thomas, he fooled around quite a lot. And um, around 1920, um, she and um, she and her husband went to France, and it was discovered there that she had contracted a venereal disease from her husband. And this is where the the story starts to get uh, get a big question mark, because Olive um, died when she was in a hotel in um, France, in Paris, France, in 1926. Uh, she took too many of these pills. They used to give them these enormous pills uh, of a drug called bichloride of mercury. And you're only supposed to take uh, one or two of them. She somehow took the entire bottle. Now, the official cause of death was accidental, but there aren't too many people who accidentally take a whole bottle of big pills. Um, so a lot of people believe that she committed suicide. Uh, she didn't die quickly. It was an agonizing death, I'm sorry to say. And poor Olive disappeared uh, from uh, the limelight. But not entirely. Because very soon after that, people back in New York at the New Amsterdam Theater started seeing Olive appearing to them. She would, have, And I have to tell you that um, my experience with researching ghosts tells me that there's a lot of different levels of ghosts. There are just ghosts that knock. Uh, there are ghosts that just open doors. Um, sometimes a ghost will appear as like a white, uh, the way you imagine a ghost is, kind of a white, filmy sort of a ghost. But then there are ghosts who may appear um, 
where they're just a head or just legs. Uh, some of the ghosts appear in full body and you feel like you're talking to an actual person uh, in the room with you. And rarer still is that the ghost who appears that way speaks. And Olive, the ghost that people kept seeing was Olive wearing a blue dress with a beautiful sash and a little hat, sort of like what she actually had worn uh, in part of her Follies Act. And uh, she, she was carrying a blue bottle. Now the bichloride of mercury pills were in a blue bottle. And she would speak to them. And she would always said the same thing. She, appear, she appeared, by the way, only to men. And she would speak to them and she would say this. She would say, how you doing, fella? Now, I'm imitating her because over the years, I have spoken to about a dozen different people who have seen and spoken to Olive. And when I ask them, these are people who don't know each other, they imitate her voice exactly the same way. It's almost as if she had actually appeared to them. But anyway, she appeared periodically in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. Uh, the New Amsterdam kind of went downhill in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they never showed pornographic films there, but um, there was a long period of time where the New Amsterdam, like the rest of 42nd Street, went sharply downhill, and uh, um, it was very uh, little used. But then in the 1990s, Disney came in and leased the theater. They spent $27 million to fix it up. And this is kind of where I come into the story because I was working at Playbill during that time. And my coworker, Louis Botto, uh, who used to do the At This Theater column, he started getting calls, calls from people that he knew over at the New Amsterdam. The workers who were working on the theater said that they were having a peculiar encounter. One, one night, one of the uh, guys working, and I'm sorry, one day, there's a, it's a night story. One day while the guys were working on the theater, a woman appeared in the middle of all the construction. She was wearing the blue dress, a little cap, carrying a... Uh, blue bottle and she said how you doing fella and when he turned to tell her that she should be not be in the construction area she disappeared he went down and he uh complained to the foreman and said there's a woman wandering around up there it's not safe she should really be wearing a, a hard hat if she has to be there for some reason and uh the foreman who had heard about the legend said you have seen the ghost of olive thomas olive continues to appear frequently, regularly at the theater. There are certain things that she likes and certain things she doesn't like. One of the things that she likes is, now I took this picture. This is what you see when you go in the stage door of the New Amsterdam Theater. They keep a picture of Olive Thomas at every entrance to the theater because when people come into work, they have to say, good morning, Olive. And if they don't say good morning, Olive, stuff happens. Stuff happens in their dressing rooms, stuff happening in their workplaces. Things get lost, things get moved, things get knocked off of, of uh, dressing room tables. Olive is very je jealous. She feels that she is the queen of the New Amsterdam Theater. Um, I, uh, I spoke to the, 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 when I took this picture, I actually spoke to the doorman, and this was um, last summer. He said that they had hired a new security guard to, uh, to stay in the theater late. And um, he said that uh, while he was there, the uh, Olive appeared to the, um, uh, to, to the watchman. And she said, how you doing, fella? And then she turned and she walked through the wall that she was standing next to. The night watchman called up the uh, house manager, a guy named Dana Amendola. D Dana confirmed this story to me. And he said, I quit. And he walked out and he would not work at the theater after that. And they had to hire somebody new. Uh, Olive appears regularly. Um, she appears, as I mentioned, mainly to men. She appears, and this is why I mentioned the trap before, the area where she is most active is in the trap, that area under the stage, upstairs in what used to be the New Amsterdam roof. It's now the offices of Disney. And um, um, th that's where uh, that's where all the, the people who work on the productions there, they actually kept the proscenium arch, but they turned all the rest of it into offices. But the area that used to be the trap is where Olive is most frequently seen. And I had a chance to tour the trap. And there was some some odd noises, some odd things happened when I was down there. Um, I would say that I saw her, but I really wanted to see her. I will say this. When I was down there, 
I, I was standing there and I said, how you doing, Olive? Hello, are you there? Are you there? Nothing. But then I remembered that women from that period took their married names very, very, very seriously. And so instead of calling her Olive by her first name, since I had not met her, I said, uh, Mrs. Pickford, are you here? And there was a huge piece of scenery that was sitting down. There must have been 800 pounds. It went boom. And I was standing with one of the carpenters who had seen her. And, and the two of us laughed. I mean, we didn't think we had actually heard Olive. But I decided to try it again. I said, Mrs. Pickford, are you there? And the same piece of scenery jumped. And it made a sound. Scared the pants off of me. How much more I would love to have seen her and heard her talk to me. But I did not. So... I just want and I just wanted one more picture, one beautiful picture that I wanted to show you. This is a poster from the um, the Ziegfeld Midnight Frolics with a, with a picture of the beautiful Olive Thomas. So um, Olive is still there. If you go to see a show there, I hope that the theaters are going to open again. Um, they're, they're now saying they're going to open them next June. I hope they do. Um, when they do, if you walk down the long gallery from 42nd Street to the actual theater, the actual box where the theater is is on 41st street but you have to walk down a long arcade they have a picture of all the wonderful stars that played there back in the uh follies days and the last picture you come to on the right side is one person that you'd never heard of before tonight olive thomas and you better say hello to olive okay uh moving on um oh i just wanted to to mention um i always try to include uh, if, if I'm doing something, for instance, in Connecticut, as I am tonight, I just wanted to include some interesting local ghost things. By the way, I lived in, in Westport for several years. I lived on Weathervane Hill over on the west side of town. And I, it was during a period of time when Ed and Lorraine Warren, the ghost hunters who live in Bridgeport, were very active. Uh, at the end of this, when I take questions, I, am, I have always thought that there must be a ghost at the Westport Country Playhouse. I saw every show at the Westport Country Playhouse for 14 years because I reviewed, first I reviewed for the old uh, magazine uh, Fair Press, then I reviewed for the Stanford Advocate where I was arts editor, and then I was at the uh, New Haven Register and I reviewed theater for them. So I had a chance to see all the shows at Westport Country Playhouse. I never got a ghost story out of it. If anybody here tonight has a ghost story, mwah, please share. Okay. Uh, a few more ghosts. Um, uh, the, uh, this is the uh, Al Hirschfeld Theater where Moulin Rouge is playing. Um, uh, for many years, this theater was known as the Martin Beck Theater, named for Martin Beck, who was an uh, entrepreneur. He booked uh, vaudeville acts. He booked acts into the Palace Theater, by the way, which we'll talk about momentarily. The Palace Theater was, at that time, was the pinnacle of vaudeville. Vaudeville, for those who may not know, that before television and, and even before movies when it started, um, it was live entertainment. You would come in and you would see like 10 different acts. One would be a singing act, a comedy act. They'd have a dog act. They would, uh, whatever they could, a juggler, whatever they could come up with. Um, and Martin Beck used to book the Palace Theater because all the acts in vaudeville, they dreamed of one thing, and that was playing the palace. Uh, the palace was where you would play if you had reached the pinnacle of that. And Martin Beck was the guy who chose the acts for, for the palace. And he got kicked out um, because it was felt he had too much power. So his bosses kicked him out. So he opened his own theater over on 45th Street called the Martin Beck Theater. And he was very proud of it. And around the time, around the turn of the century, uh, the, the 21st century, they decided to rename the Martin Beck Theater after caricaturist Al Hirschfeld. And this is what the marquee looks like. If you look up at that picture of him, it's a, it's a recreation of a drawing he made of himself. And he's using his own head for an inkwell. I don't know. That seems creepy to me. But anyway, um, after they changed the name of the theater, things started to happen at the old um, Martin Beck Theater. They had a whole display of artworks by, Martin, by um, Al Hirschfeld that they had included. They would come in in the morning, and somebody had opened up the refrigerator, taken out those, those uh, $10 orange drinks, and thrown them at the, uh, at the glass that was, that was protecting the uh, drawings. Um, things would be knocked down around the theater. People would trip coming down the stairs. It got to the point where the actors actually complained to the owners of the theater and said, um, 
something is going on here. Um, we think it's a ghost. And of course, they dismissed that. But the things just kept happening. So the owners of the theater, a uh, uh, company called Jew Jamson, they, what they did was they did not change the name of the theater. They put a plaque in the lobby saying this theater was built by Martin Beck. Martin Beck did this, that, and the other thing. And he deserves to be remembered, even though it's not named after him anymore. And you know something? After they put that plaque up, the problem stopped. Was there a ghost there? Was it just a coincidence? I'll leave that to you. Actors are convinced, though, they're not in any doubt that it was the ghost of Martin, uh, of, uh, Martin Beck who did not like his theater being renamed. This is Martin Beck. Okay. Um, not all ghosts uh, appear as, as uh, figures. Um, the St. James Theater, um, where Frozen was playing up until COVID came in, um, it has a laughing ghost. Now I got this story from one of the uh, one of the ushers that works in the theater. During performances, suddenly there will be this burst of insane laughter, and it's been going on show after show for years now. And um, this usher, she told me that when she worked downstairs, the people in the audience downstairs would complain and say could you please get, ask that idiot up in the balcony to stop laughing inappropriately because it's disturbing the performance. But when she was in the balcony or, or in the mezzanine, uh, people would say, could you please get that idiot who's laughing down in the orchestra to stop? It's really disturbing the performance. So well, well, I, there was a period of time where I was doing interviews on what's now Sirius XM radio. And I had Laura Benanti, who was at the time appearing as Gypsy in... Uh, the uh, Patti LuPone revival of Gypsy. And um, I told her this story. I said, do you, have you heard this ghost? And I, when I described to, it to her the way I just described it to you, she said, oh my God, that happened to me just the other night. I was singing Little Lamb. Little Lamb is a very quiet, very touching song. And it, it, it's, uh, Gypsy is singing about the fact that it's her birthday, but she doesn't know how old she is because her mother won't tell her how old she is because her mother wants to pretend she's younger than she is. And at the end, you don't know this until the end of the song where she says, um, I, I wonder how old I am. It's the heartbreaking climax to the song. Just as she was saying that she said she heard this insane laughter coming from the house. And I said, you know, I've been trying to track down what this ghost is all about. I said, do you think it's like an old actor or something? And she said, no. I am sure it's not an actor. I'm sure it's not a professional. A professional would never interrupt a performance like that. And I believe her. A lot of these ghosts, by the way, appear only after performances. I think a lot of them are professional and they do not disrupt the house when the audience is there. They appear to the people who work at the theater um, and, and usually after hours. But the laughing ghost of the St. James is one who has the nerve to appear when the audience is in the house. Very unprofessional. Um, there are a number of celebrities who have uh, are believed to uh, haunt theaters. Bob Fosse is believed to haunt the Lyceum Theater. Bob Fosse, the great director, choreographer, and one-time dancer himself, um, which is odd because the his favorite theater was not the Lyceum. It was the Broadhurst. A lot of his biggest hits were uh, done at the Broadhurst, and, and he also had some shows at the Palace. But um, they can hear th they can hear him laughing. He has a very distinctive laugh. And the reason I use this picture is because they smell cigarette smoke. Now we all know they haven't allowed cigarettes in theaters in years. They smell cigarette smoke, and the people who work in the theater say, "That's Bob. That's Bob." Um, Patty Lapone told me that she encountered a ghost in the dressing room of the Barrymore Theater. Her ghost, um, when she would be getting dressed, she would feel, as she was standing there putting on her, her clothes, or picking clothes out of the closet, I should say, she would feel a little foot pressed down on the tip of her shoe. And she, the first time she did it, she started back, and she thought there was somebody in the closet. Pushed aside the, the dresses, nobody in there. Night after night, when she would go to get dressed, she would feel that little foot come out and press down on her foot. And she would look to see there was, there was nothing to see. But she felt that uh, it was a way that the ghost, whoever it was in the Barrymore Theater, was trying to communicate with her and tell her 
and, and encourage her and tell her. It was the ghost's way of saying, have a great performance tonight, Patty. And by the way, I have to say, in my research of ghosts, very few of the ghosts are actually scary Halloween type ghosts. Most of these are, as I described earlier, people who just love the theater and don't want to leave. And so a lot of times they are supportive or helpful or encouraging. Um, and, uh, and it's almost, and that's why the theater people kind of welcome them because they rarely are harmful ghosts. Um, my, probably the cutest ghost, I'm going to tell you the cutest ghost story. Uh, I, I gave you a little hint there. The Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and I love this story. Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., when they were building it, um, the workmen saw there was a cat that kept coming onto the construction site. And the people who were um, working on the theater kind of adopted the cat. The cat just, even with all the noise and the dirt and the smoke and everything else, this cat just loved being on the construction site. So when they built the theater, they built the Kennedy Center in the balcony. They built a little place for the cat to sit, and they named the cat Mosby. And, you know, uh, Mosby eventually used up all nine of his lives, and he passed on to Kitty Heaven. Um, but people at the theater still see the ghost, and the people at the Kennedy Center have embraced this ghost to the point where they hired somebody to write a book about Mosby, the Kennedy Center theater cat. And um, they sell, you know, they've, they've monetized it. They sell little stuffed Mosby's in the lobby, et cetera, et cetera. But people say that you can still sometimes, from the stage, you can see the cat sitting on that little shelf that they built for him in the, in the balcony. And sometimes when the actors are backstage, they can feel, you know how a cat will rub against your, your shin, rub against your ankles? They can feel a cat rubbing against them. When they look down, no cat. It's the ghost of Mosby, the Kennedy Center Theater cat. Okay. Several people uh, in the run-up to this were posted notes, and they wanted to know if I was going to talk about David Belasco, and yes, I am. David Belasco is another of the most, most active theater ghosts on Broadway. He uh, haunts the theater named for himself. Now, Belasco um, was part of the um, era of these entrepreneurs who did everything. He would write the play. He would produce the play. He would direct the play. He would cast the play. He ran the box office. He counted up the money. He wrote the checks. He did everything. And he was a little bit eccentric. They called him the Bishop of Broadway because he liked to dress up like a bishop or like a clergyman. He would wear a Roman collar. I, as you can see in this picture, he's wearing his Roman collar. Um, and he, uh, he had a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful life. He, not only did he build the theater and name it after himself, on the top of the theater, he built an apartment for himself to live in. So in addition to everything else, Dave lived at the theater. And the apartment, known as the Belasco apartment, is still up there. Now, Dave passed away in 1930. Um, and since then, people who work at the theater see him pretty frequently. Um, uh, I, I have a story behind this, but let me let me just tell you that uh, one of the things that he does is during rehearsals, he shows up at the theater and he sits in the back of the theater or he sits up in the balcony and actors on the stage can see him. Sometimes if they don't know about the legend, they'll say, who is that guy watching the rehearsals? People have kind of come to take it as a uh, as a good luck charm that Belasco is in the house and keeping an eye on shows. And now if he doesn't appear, they think that he does not approve of the show that they are doing, or he doesn't approve of the job that they did, or the actor who's on the stage. Now, even though Belasco used to dress up as a clergyman, he certainly did not live a, a clergyman's life. Let's put it that way. He was very much a ladies' man at a, you know, in a much more sexist, horrible age, when uh, there was something called the casting couch, where actresses would, uh, in, in order to get parts, they would uh, sleep with the director. And that was Belasco. Belasco had built a special little elevator in his theater, about the size of a phone booth. And um, you can ride up, uh, he could ride up and down to his apartment in it. And he would sometimes, um, uh, if he found uh, a, a, a a willing and uh, ambitious uh, young actress, she would ride up with him in this elevator. Um, 
I'm going to tell you a story. You may hear the story later on. I have a little clip to play for you. But um, I, got, I befriended the house manager of the Belasco Theater, and she told me all these incredible stories. Her office is just below what's now the... Uh, her ceiling is the floor of the Belasco apartment. And she said that she would sit in her office in the evening and she could hear parties upstairs uh, with 1920s music and she would go running upstairs to see who had broken in. There was nobody there. To the point where she put in a motion sensor and a camera so that she could watch it on her desktop when she was working. And she would be sitting there in her office and she could hear people walking back and forth, dancing, and she could hear music coming through the ceiling and the motion sensor showed nothing. The camera that she had in the apartment showed nothing. Uh, so back to this elevator. While she was working for the theater, suddenly during performances, the elevator would start up and she could hear the sound of the engine starting, the motor that raised and lowered the, the elevator. Um, the elevator was on a chain and she could hear the, the uh, links clinking and she was concerned that um, it was going that they would that it was malfunctioning and it was going to be a fire uh, the, the um, elevator was not up to code uh, so it had been walled up years before uh, so she called up the Schubert um, uh, carpenters uh, it's a Schubert theater owned by the Schubert organization they can, and she said I'd like you to go in there I want you to take out the elevator car. I want you to take out all the machinery. Uh, I don't want to run the risk that this thing is going to start up and cause a fire. So uh, they opened up the wall. They looked in, and there was no elevator. There was no chain. There was no motor. It had all been taken out years and years earlier. So the Belasco Theater, in addition to being haunted by David Belasco, is also has a ghost elevator operating in it. By the way, some of these theaters that I've mentioned have more than one ghost. Over at the New Amsterdam where um, Olive Thomas haunts, there's another ghost there with what I consider to be the best ghost name. There is a disembodied shadow that haunts the staircases, and the people who work there call it the Black Goon. Great name. Um, the Black Goon, you'll be walking up the stairs, and suddenly you'll see a shadow walking down the stairs with no, not attached to any person. Like Peter Pan, the shadow has become detached from whoever it once was. At the Belasco Theater, they have another ghost that who's known as the Pink Lady. Not from Greece, Pink Lady. This is a pink cloud that ice cold that appears in the ladies' dressing room and sometimes on the stairs of the theater going from the uh, orchestra up to the balcony. It will appear as a light pink cloud. And if you put your hand in the cloud, it's ice cold. It doesn't do anything more than that, and eventually it dissipates. But if you can imagine, if you're getting dressed and suddenly you're enveloped in an ice cold pink cloud, that's going to be a creepy moment in your professional life. So anyway, here is David Belasco with the ladies. Um, let me see. Uh, I have a clip that I'd like to play you. The Belasco apartment, needless to say, because of the fire issues, because... Um, I can tell you right now, the floor is, is all uh, rotted. It's all soft. So they don't let, like people to go up there because it's kind of dangerous. So it, and so many people wanted to go in. The Schubert's finally said, it's closed. It's locked off. Um, uh, we're not going to allow anybody to go up there anymore. Uh, in 2010, they renovated the Belasco Theater. At that time, I was working at Playbill. I went into the Belasco with a camera crew ostensibly to write about the... Um, the renovation, which was beautiful, by the way. They did a gorgeous job. They did not include the Belasco apartment with the renovation. But I thought, well, as long as we're here, can we see the Belasco apartment? And they said, sure. And I'm going to try to show you that the clip of me inside the Belasco apartment so that you can take a rare glimpse of something very few have seen, and that is the inside of the Belasco apartment. Hang on. Wish me luck here. Right. You're going to hear some of these things that I said before. You're going to hear them again. Sorry. All right. Here, you go. here I am going. Oh, 
Okay, sorry everybody. I think Robert has had a small technical issue. Um, hopefully he will be back shortly. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions for Robert, please feel free to, ah, here we go. I think, nope. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the ask a question tab and we're just getting Robert back now. Sorry about that, everybody. We'll be back shortly. Did you not see the video? Uh, no, you actually disappeared altogether. So we'll just keep like going. A ghost. Like a ghost, I disappeared. It was like a ghost. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to show that that clip. Um, I thought we, we we tried testing this before. Can I try one more time? Um, you know, given the time, why don't you just Let's, tell us some more ghost all right. stories? All right. Um, the uh, uh, it's on. If you look up Viagas, V I A G A S, and Belasco on YouTube, you can watch it for yourself uh, at your leisure. Um, so anyway, getting back to um, getting back to my uh, my ghosts. Let's get back to the slideshow. Okay, here we go. All right, can you hear me now? Yep, can you hear, I can hear okay. you. All right, um, this is a wonderful um, ghost story. This actually is one that I've read about and researched. Uh, I did not experience this myself because it happened in 1909. Um, this uh, gentleman with this uh, abundant, uh, incredible mustache is a guy named Clyde Fitch. Clyde Fitch was a very, very popular playwright uh, about, uh, about 120 years ago. Um, he wrote, a lot of his shows were done again and again. He wrote, um, uh, probably his biggest hit was something called Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines, which is, you know, completely forgotten today. Barbara Fritchie, and he wrote it. So many plays. He wrote dozens and dozens of plays. Very successful plays. Um, in 1909, he wrote what turned out to be his final play. It was called The City. Um, and uh, while it was in rehearsals, he died. And they decided they were very sad. And the people who were working on the show said the show must go on. And so they, uh, they went ahead and they opened the show. And on opening night, when the actors came out to take their curtain calls, the cast came out, then the stars came out and bowed. And right after that, Clyde Fitch came walking out of the wings, walked to center stage, took a lovely theatrical bow, causing people to scream and faint, and he vanished from the center of the stage. It was one of the most widely seen theatrical ghosts. Uh, it was widely covered at the time in the newspapers. Um, it's just so unlikely and it just sounds so made up that people, you know, people rarely talk about it today. But at the time, hundreds and hundreds of people witnessed it at the same time. And a lot of these, because it was opening night, a lot of these knew Clyde, had seen Clyde, had worked with Clyde, and they were investors in the show. And they attested that this was Clyde who had come out and taken a bow. And the fact that he vanished is also not something that you can hire somebody to do. Uh, so I love that ghost story, and I'm just going to include it because I love it. Um, good old Clyde. They don't grow mustaches like that anymore. Judy Garland. How are we doing on time? I don't want to run too far over on time. Ju oh, it's, it looks like it's 25 after 5. Um, Judy Garland. Uh, the, I mentioned the Palace Theater earlier where Martin Beck had worked so hard and where he was from and from which he was fired they're actually in the process of of literally lifting the palace up because if you look where it is it's a great location right in the middle of times square uh and the people who own it felt it would be better to use that for a retail space so they're actually literally lifting the entire theater up and building retail space underneath it and having the theater be like on the second or third floor commerce anyway um judy uh appeared at the palace in the 1950s and it was a, a legendary appearance uh you know one of these things everybody claims uh to have seen her and people who saw her said they've never seen anything like it she sang all of her hits and all of her fans were there etc and um judy had the theater redesigned 
partly for this performance. She wanted, at the end of the show, not to just take a bow and go into the wings. She wanted to walk up the aisle through her fans as if she were part of their world and disappear into their world. And they built a special door at the back of the playhouse of the palace, uh, which has since then become known as the Judy Garland door. And she would walk up the aisle and she'd open the door and she would kind of disappear and the door would take her backstage. Um, that, uh, Judy is no longer with us, hasn't been with us for many years now, but people who work at the palace claim that when you, if you stand by the door late at night and put your ear against the door, you can hear her singing to this day. Uh, the palace is known on Broadway as having the most ghosts of any theater. S legend has it that it has 120 ghosts. I have spoken to a lot of people. I spoke to Andrea McArdle, uh, the original Annie, who appeared there in Beauty and the Beast. And she said that she came down from her dressing room one night to walk through the, um, walk through the uh, house. And there was a man dressed all in white, play, vigorously playing the cello in the pit. And she went to the doorman and she said, who, who's that guy playing cello in the pit? And she said that uh, the doorman said, you have just seen the ghost of the cellist. We have a ghost musician in the house. And she went back and he was gone. Um, a, a fellow that I know who worked at the, uh, uh, ran the concession at the theater. He would work there sometimes late at night. And he said, he had several ghostly appearances. He, he said that there was a man dressed in a, in a great coat, a big brown coat and a top hat would walk past the door of his office and he would run out to see if, wh who it was and there'd be nobody there. One night he heard this sort of rolling sound and he walked out into, the, into the, this long arcade, walked down and walked into the theater itself and he could hear above his head the sound of something rolling on the carpet in the back of the mezzanine. He went up the stairs and came around the corner. He said he saw a little boy playing with trucks and rolling those trucks along the carpet. And he looked up and when he saw my friend, he vanished. Also people who work on the stage of the theater say that there is a little girl in the mezzanine, the first mezzanine, there's several there, in the first mezzanine who peeks over the backs of the chairs and then she like hides back down. He says, it's the creepiest thing you ever saw in your life. A little girl in the same section with a little boy with the, uh, the trucks is uh, hopefully their friends um, because they're there. It looks like they're going to be there for eternity, um, but they don't know who it is. They don't know where she came from. They just know there's this little girl who peeks over the chairs and then disappears. Um, not all the stories uh, are happy stories. Um, in Chicago, there was a famous fire at the Iroquois Theater. Now, the Iroquois Theater uh, was built at a time when they were if you notice, there aren't too many theaters from before 1900. Why? Because they burned down. The theaters were made of wood. The curtains were made of cloth. The, the backstage was filled with these, um, the fly space above the stage was filled with canvas. The canvas, they used to use a lot of canvas drops in those days. It was basically built for fire. And a lot of those old theaters just burned down. Well, when they built the Iroquois in Chicago, it was kind of like the Titanic. They said it was fireproof. It could never burn down. Um, they had, um, they had uh, shortly before the fire, they had had a famous fire in New York called the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. A sweatshop had burned down and they had locked the doors so that the workers could, would not go out and smoke cigarettes or wander off. So they locked all the doors. And when the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire occurred, a lot of people um, died in the fire. When they built the Iroquois, they put what we now know, uh, know of as riot bars on most of the doors. That means that if there's a crowd, see, part of the problem with the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire was they couldn't open the doors because people also because people were pressing against it and they, they couldn't, the doors opened inward. Now all doors are required to open outward. Um, when they built the Iroquois Theater, they said that all the doors that led to the street had riot bars on them. Uh, that the theater could not, that they had a, 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 um, a fireproof curtain that would come down. Um, that, that would, if the fire started backstage, it would lower the curtain and it would snuff the fire. Well, needless to say, I think you can tell where this story is going. Uh, on the night in question, they had a very popular uh, 
act at the theater. And people the, people would use the riot bars to sneak their friends into the theater. So, of course, what did they do? They locked, they chained all the riot bars so that they wouldn't work. Um, when the fire started on the stage, the stagehands panicked and ran. And so they did not lower the fireproof curtain. Fire swept through the theater. Um, it was sort of like the... Um, uh, Poseidon adventure. People from the orchestra couldn't get out, and so they ran upstairs. They couldn't get out. They, they finally, they were able to open some doors and get out onto the fire escapes. But the fire escapes, they once again, they had locked them so that, that people could not slide the, uh, the ladders up and down. And so people were stuck on the roof of the theater as the whole theater was engulfed in flames. And a lot of people wound up jumping to their deaths in the alley next to the theater. Uh, the theater has since been um, rebuilt. It's not called the Iroquois anymore. Um, people who work at the theater, though, say that if you go out at night into that alleyway, you can still hear people screaming. Uh, so that's kind of a creepy theater story. Um, those poor people at the Iroquois, can you imagine? Um, uh, here's a little happier story, and this one I'm bringing you from London. Um, uh, King Charles II um, became king after, there was a period of time where the Puritans took over the government and they killed Charles's father, Charles I. They beheaded him and Charles II fled to France and um, he hid out there. And for the better part of 20 years, England was run as a commonwealth, but it was kind of like the reign of terror. It was a terrible, terrible time. And one of the terrible things that were done during that time was they banned all theater. There was no theater. It was kind of like, well, it's kind of like New York now, except it went on for 20 years. They allowed no theater. Finally, people got so sick of the Puritans, they kicked them out and they brought back King Charles. And there was a period of time called the uh, Restoration because they restored the monarchy. And King Charles II... Uh, as you can tell from this uh, picture of him, he was a party boy and he loved good things. He loved food. He loved drink. He really loved going to the theater and he reopened all the theaters and there was a huge burst of theater, which I hope, I'm hoping is going to happen with us once the Broadway theaters are reopened. But one of the reasons he liked going to the theater is that his mistress was an actress, Nell Gwynn, who you see in this picture on the right. And Nell was a, a wonderful actress, considered an incredible beauty of her time. And um, King Charles had a secret passage built under uh, Drury Lane in London to the Drury Lane Theater, which still stands, by the way. Um, the Drury Lane is where Nell did a lot of her performances. It was the primary theater of the time. And he built this tunnel so that he could sneak in and uh, have an assignation with the beautiful Nell Gwynn. And um, all these hundreds of years later, apparently actors who work at the Drury Lane say that they will encounter the ghost of King Charles II and they assume that he is wandering the theater looking for the lovely Nell Gwynn. Okay, I, those, are my, those are some of my stories. I have literally hundreds of stories, but you know what? I wanted to leave time for your questions and maybe to hear some stories that you have. And I am looking for the Westport Country Playhouse stories. So if anybody has one, now is the time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. Um, You're so welcome. If, for anybody else who's watching, feel free to ask a question in the Ask a Question tab. We do actually have one right now um, from Addison, and she wants to know which theater is the most haunted. I would like to, to expand that slightly. So mm -hmm. I want the most haunted on Broadway and the most haunted in the world. Okay. The most haunted on Broadway, I'm going to have to give that one to the palace as I mentioned, they claim they have 120 ghosts. I came out with about a half a dozen ghost stories uh, tonight, but there are many, many more. There is uh, supposedly a ghost of a uh, acrobat, uh, Louis Borsellino, um, who fell to his death uh, during a, a high wire act. Some people say that he did not fall to his death. I've heard conflicting stories and I've read conflicting stories, um, but supposedly whether he f actually felt his death at the theater and has been haunting it since then, or whether he died of natural causes and came back, supposedly if you see a high wire act uh, in the theater that, um, and you see him fall because he falls when, he, when he's haunting the theater, 
um, that uh, your days are numbered. So that's kind of a that's kind of a creepy ghost story. I'm going to have to say the palace. As far as active ghosts, it's going to have to go to Olive Thomas at the New Am or uh, Belasco at the Belasco because they keep appearing. Um, there's a uh, uh, there was a show there called at the at the uh, Belasco called Passing Strange, and uh, it was uh, primarily uh, African American performers. And one night, uh, Daniel Breaker, the actor, um, was getting made up in his dressing room, and he told me he was looking in the mirror, and suddenly he could see sitting behind him was it what he described as an old white man. It was an old man with a lion's mane of white hair, Roman collar, sitting there watching him getting made up. And he turned around and he said, what, what are you doing in here? Get out of here. When he turned around, there was nobody behind him. Um, and when he went to complain to the um, house manager, they said, oh, you saw Belasco. Um, there's a, an actress who appeared in a, in a musical called Dracula. Uh, Melissa Errico is her name. She says that she could hear people fighting, arguing through the wall of her dressing room. And they were, on the other side of that was the alley. And she would go out in the alley and try to get people, she said, well, wanted to say, why are you fighting out here in the alley? There was nobody in the alley. She'd be sitting there in her dressing room, hearing the sounds of this wild cat fight going on through the wall, and there was nobody on the other side of the wall. There are many, many stories out of the Belasco Theater. Um, I, I have plenty more, uh, but I would have to say that as far as the most actively haunted theater, I'd have to say it was either the New Amsterdam or the Belasco. Great. Um, Addison would also like to know, how did you get interested in the ghostly aspect of theatrical lore? Um, I would sit down. One of my one of my lucky gifts as a journalist in theater is that people like to tell me stories. And a lot of times when I'd be sitting down late at night with a bunch of people who work in the theater, I had written a book about a chorus line uh, with the original cast. And so I had a chance to, and, and also I wrote a book about the Fantastics, the amazing story of the Fantastics. And I got to hang out with the original cast of these shows. And I'll tell you something, when actors get together, they talk about food and they talk about ghosts. And so I started hearing these stories and telling them to other people. And when I would tell other people, they would say, oh, I have a ghost story. I, I had an experience like that. A lot of times people don't want to tell you the story at the, right away because they're worried that you're going to think they're insane. Whereas if you ch spread some chum around, if you tell them a few ghost stories, then they realize that you respect them and then they start to tell you stories. And so it's kind of snowballed. Um, do you have a favorite ghost or ghost story? Uh, I, I have to say Mosby, the, the theater cat, that is that story warms my heart. Uh, I would love to meet uh, Olive Thomas. I actually asked Disney if I could sleep over at the theater. They wouldn't let me sleep over the whole night. They let me stay till midnight and let me come back at six. And I had a, a motion sensor and a, um, a microphone set up in the theater. Unfortunately, she did not appear. Apparently, you can't, like, it's hard to ask her to appear. She has to just want to appear to you. So I've tried for about five years to court her. You know, I called her by the right name. I'd come to visit the theater a lot. I would say hello when I came to the theater. But she just did not favor me with a um, with an appearance. So I would have to say I would really love to hear her say "How you doing, fella?" to me. Uh, that's one of my that's on my bucket list. Okay, let us know if that happens. I will. Okay, so Barbara would like to know: Do you have any ghost stories about John Wilkes Booth or Edwin Booth? Um, Edwin, they were brothers, um, and they and the the. Um, Booth Theater on Broadway, people think it's named for John Wilkes Booth. It's not. It's named for Edwin Booth, who was, a, quite honestly, was a much bigger actor than his brother. Um, uh, I, I'm friends with the guy who wrote uh, the book Backstage at the Lincoln Assassination. And uh, he has spent a lot of time at the um, Ford's Theater. Um, and uh, he has also gathered a number of stories. Uh, there are a, apparently are a lot of ghosts that... Uh, that he has heard about at the theater. But Booth himself, I guess he just had such an awful experience because, you know, after he assassinated Lincoln, he jumped from the box onto the stage and broke his leg. Um, and I, you know, it, I think he just does not have very pleasant memories of that theater. And 
um, maybe he, the, the other theater ghosts cast him out because he, I do not have a ghost story about him specifically at that theater, although there, apparently there are a lot of ghostly experiences, but none that have been identified as, um, as John Wilkes himself. Yes. Um, I've been there and I think you can, can you still go in, they have like an exhibit space and they talk about some of their ghost stories there. Right. They do. So, they do. Yes. Uh, the theater, you know, like everything else, the theater is kind of, uh, you know, um, it suspended currently. I hope we'll get, we'll get into all these theaters again before long. Right. So I just have two more quick questions for you. Mm -hmm. One is, what is the spookiest ghost story that you have? <laughs> In case, unless you have already told us which one it is. <laughs> I have, I have, a, a, I've mentioned a couple of the this, this spookier ghost stories. Um, one of the stories that I have is from the Fox Theater in Atlanta. The Fox Theater in Atlanta is also, it's interesting how many child ghosts there are at these theaters. Um, the Fox Theater in Atlanta, people who work late at night say that they can hear a little girl laughing and talking and bouncing a ball. A lot of these kids have toys. I guess they, they bring toys in. They say you can't bring anything with you into the afterlife. But apparently some of these kids have brought some toys into the afterlife. Uh, and and um, they say that, that, that it give, makes them feel very comf comfortable to know that this, uh, that this little girl is there. Personally, I would find it incredibly creepy that the, the ghost of the little girl, once again, maybe, maybe something about kids, a child ghost is particularly heartrending and... and uh, you know, makes me feel very sad. Um, but the, that ghost at the palace of the little girl who peeks over the seats, you know, you wonder how did she get there? I'm sorry, my heart just goes out to, to, to something like that. Um, uh, so I would say that, that, that those, the child ghost stories are the creepiest ghost stories to me. The little boy who plays with his trucks. Can you imagine you just playing with trucks for eternity in the back of the palace? I guess there's worse place, places to be for eternity. But still, um, I would have to put those as some of the creepiest stories that I, I've heard. Okay. Everybody's wondering why I started smiling during that. It's because when I worked at the Fox, and I only just you remembered the... this story, somebody actually told me about the bouncing ball. So uh -huh. um, <laughs> I, it just popped in when you started <laughs> the story. Yeah. Did, you um, ever did you ever experience that? Did you ever hear the? No. Mm -mm. Nope, nope, not me. Oh. My friends, okay. down, my friends down there say that uh, that you, you, it happens pretty frequently. That uh, backstage, you hear the bouncing ball and hear the little girl laughing and talking, and there's no little girl. Well, I had a lot of other things going on then. Anywho, um, so we have one last question, and Celeste would like to know, is there a book that you've written about all of these stories, or are you planning on writing a book about them? I have... I have been trying to write a book for years about this, and actually, I'm meeting with a, an editor named John Cerullo, who is interested in in doing the book of ghost stories. And so, uh, if you'll all please just put your hands together and say a little prayer for me, I I hope that um, sometime in the next year or two that the uh, the ghost story book will will finally make its appearance. In the meantime, I just keep gathering and gathering and. Uh, uh, I'm going to start a podcast where I'm going to tell the ghost stories also on the Broadway Podcast Network. So um, I'm hoping that that will become a regular feature there. Oh, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Robert. This, My, was, sure. this was the best way to pl to spend an October <laughs> evening. What a creepy um, day it was today, too. The <laughs> right. Wind blowing and a, like it was, I thought, perfect setup for the talk. Tonight. Right. So for those of you who are watching, feel free to share this Crowdcast link with your friends who might enjoy tonight's ghost stories because they can watch the replay starting later this evening, especially fine for those who can't sleep. Remember to check out westbrooklibrary.org for more upcoming spooky or not so spooky events, resource guides, and of course, the catalog. Thank you again for a lovely evening. Thank you very much for having me at your beautiful library. I remember the old library, and I, when they built this new one, I said, this is like a palace. And so I'm <laughs> so pleased to be associated.